All right, good morning and welcome today. Uh, my commute down the stairs was uh, took a little longer than normal. Uh, had to stop halfway, fill up. So. so today we're going to do chapter 18. 18 today. This is the fair housing chapter, all right? This is the chapter that is, it's not, it's not a joke. I, this is a serious chapter because this chapter has criminal, potential criminal implications, and you as a practicing agent can actually get in deep trouble, all right? Now, the problem with this law, in my, not in my opinion, but the difference in this law, most laws require what's called an intent. You have to prove intent. The fair housing laws are not an intent law. They are an effects law, meaning how, what was the effect of what you said, not what was your intention. And that's very difficult because you could say something and not mean one thing, but if someone felt offended, that could be the violation, all right? And the prime example, one of the very good prime examples was I was talking, you guys remember Hussein Bolt from the Olympics from Jamaica, the speedster, right? During the Olympics last, whenever it was last time, Daryl, a friend of mine and I were talking about how fast he was. And I was in Jamaica and how hot it was down there. And I'm like, well, I know why he runs short distances because you can't run a long distance in that heat. And he said, yeah, on top of that, he said, you know, they're all fast. I went, Daryl, are you telling me that all black people are fast? And he's like, no, all speedsters, all those sprinters, even the guy that finished last is faster than me. That is a good example of a comment where he did not mean any racial intent he was talking about something completely different but i felt or affected or interpreted it different so that is the how this law is looked at it's not an intent he had no intent he was talking about all of the sprinters even the guy that finished last from ireland he said would have beat me because they're all fast and I said, oh, well, okay. And that is this issue with this law. It's not an intent. You cannot stand in front of a judge and go, well, your honor, I didn't mean to offend them. Doesn't matter. The effect was this, all right? So that, that's how this law is, it plays out. It's an effects law, not an intent law. Now, so let's go back and catch some history. And I'm gonna put on the screen here, uh, one of my slides I've worked on, maybe I'm not, maybe I should do it the right way. So what we have is a series of laws that have been enacted throughout the last 140 years, 160 years to bring us to the point that we are today. Now on the screen, I have got a slide and I can guarantee you that there's going to be questions about which act brought which protected class in. So you are going to have to know these. So let's go back and, and go through the history and I'll show you the evolution and how it happened. So in 1866, right after the Civil War, they passed this act called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 basically said it was illegal to discriminate housing based on race, all right? That was the sole classification that they used at that time was race. You could not discriminate housing based upon a person's race, all right? And that was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Then in 1896, 
all the way up to the Supreme Court, another court case called Plessy versus Ferguson. If anybody remembers their history, Plessy versus Ferguson was a situation where a black gentleman was asked to sit in the back railroad car away from the white people. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court saying it was segregation and discrimination and it was illegal. The Supreme Court ruled at that time. And if you remember though, what's the little catchphrase from this, Plessy versus Ferguson? Separate but equal. They ruled that you could have separate facilities and discriminate and segregate the races as long as both facilities were of equal stature. That would not be considered a discriminatory act. So by separating the people on this train, which is what this basically was, and putting one race in one car and one race in another was not discriminatory in nature as long as they were given equal services. Well, unfortunately, we know how that played out because it was not given equal services. So that rolls along until like 1953. And you get this thing called Brown versus Board of Education. This was a gentleman who sued the school system because they would not allow his black daughter to go to a white school. And he claimed that the schools were not equal. And this court case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And basically they ruled or overturned the Plessy versus Ferguson uh, ruling and said that you cannot inherently separate the races and give them equal treatment in education. So they put them back together like it should be. And that was the Brown versus Board of Education. Well, in 1968, there comes another court case and you guys may know or you may not know, but typically sellers and buyers don't meet until the day of closing. So what happened in uh, Jones versus Mayer, Mr. Mayer was a buyer of a property who was qualified. He had the money, he had the credit, he had the job, he got qualified, they went to closing and, they, and the seller found out that the buyer was black and refused to sell to him based upon that sole premise. The guy was qualified. So this goes to court and goes all the way up to the Supreme Court again. And the plaintiff, Mr. Mayor, had an attorney that said, hey, your honors, you guys made this decision in 1866 that said you cannot discriminate based on race. And they said, you are absolutely correct. And they forced the sale of the property. And then they amended the Civil Rights Act of 1866 to come up with what's called the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Specifically, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act will morph into what we now know as the Fair Housing Act. All right, so just one of the acts, it's actually eight through 10, uh, becomes the Civil Rights Act or becomes the Fair Housing Act. Now, the Supreme Court also made one other change to the 1866 law. They said, well, it is illegal to base uh, discrimination based on race. And they reaffirmed that in their hearing. But then they went another step further and said, it is inherently indistinguishable to determine a person's race from their color from their national origin or from their religion. So in 1968, they reaffirmed race and said, yes, that's, but then they added three more, color, national origin, and religion. So in 1968, you now have four protected classes, race, color, religion, national origin, 
because they said you couldn't determine the difference between those four. All right. So that rolls along till 1974. And in 1974, they had this thing called the Housing and Community Development Act. And in this act, they add one more protected class called sex. All right. Now, in this 1974 act, the intention of the word sex is to mean gender, male and female, not sexual orientation, sexual identification. None of that was even a concept, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So in 74, they added sex to the protected class, meaning it was illegal to discriminate male and female, okay? Then in 1988, they amend the Fair Housing Act one more time, and it's called the Fair Housing Amendments Act, but they added two more to come up with disability and familial status. That is family status, all right? So what you have in 1988 are seven protected classes, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and familial status. Those are our seven federally protected classes to this day. The Fair Housing Act has not changed or formally been amended since 1988. And those are our seven federally protected classes. You guys should learn them immediately. All right. And my running joke that I tell everybody is there's only one thing I discriminate on, and that's green. You've got green, you're my client. You don't have green, I don't give a crap. Black, yellow, blue, green, purple, Jewish, Mexican, whatever. Doesn't bother me a bit, shouldn't bother you guys, all right? Green, and for this joke, credit is green, okay? Um, so those are our seven protected classes. Now, those are federal protection. Some states have added what they call an overlay on those seven. Like Washington State, for example, has added, they have added sexual orientation and they have added military. So I think they have nine or 10. Indiana is a cut and paste. We literally just took the federal laws and made them our state laws. So in Indiana, we have seven that we work with. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status. Those are the seven that Indiana uses for discrimination cases for housing. Now let's go back and revisit one thing that we've talked about and I wanna to touch on it again. Earlier in the previous chapter, we talked about the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And I told you there were eight of those. This is a visual joke, all right? It was not seven plus one. It's seven, the seven we just mentioned, they take away two of them and add three new ones back. So for credit, it's race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. Those are the first five that came in. Then they remove familial status and disability and they added back, if you recall, marital status, age, and dependence on public assistance. So in the ECOA, when we talk about the credit, there are eight, but it's not seven plus one. It's seven minus two plus three. For all you math majors out there. 